According to Christian theology, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. However, those particular written words were not present at the beginning of Christian theology, as that very declaration was written nearly a century after the life of Jesus Christ. Far from a mere curiosity or quirk of the culture, this gap between the event and the hit novelization gives us a window into a culture in motion, a fossilized image of early Christianity's development. See, while religious writings aim to describe the immutable nature of the universe, they come about on distinctly human timescales, and the ways in which scripture arise can tell us as much as the pages themselves. Because many religions around the world revolve around a holy text, but the order of causality can vary wildly from one culture to the next. Did a book inspire a faith? Did a religion create their book? Were the authors human or divine? For the sake of responsible scholarship and the cleanliness of my comments section, we're gonna avoid the thorny matter of God? Question mark? And simply take unattributed holy text as arriving from the great undefined mist. Whatever that means to you, have at. I am a cartoon, not a priest. Point being, the historical origins of every religion are as unique as their philosophies and practices, and that recurring dynamic helps make world religion a real treat to explore. We don't need to find it true to find it beautiful. Now, Christianity is an interesting case because the first half of its sacred text was received via the Hebrew Bible, arriving from the great undefined mist, and ascribed to the quill of God himself. According to Christians, at least. Jews recall that they wrote it over several centuries, but let's not make a fuss. Then was supplemented in the AD years by the work of distinctly human authors via the 27 books of the Christian New Testament. That gives us 27 odd angles of investigation that sustain entire universities worth of scholarship. Granted, a solid half of them are letters from one guy, but for today's video we'll focus mainly on four. The Gospels recounting the life of Jesus as written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This set of saints, called the Evangelists, are the big boys of Christian scripture because they tell the tale of Christ himself. But each of their Gospels are distinct pieces of literature in their own right which leaves us plenty to discuss. So, to learn the story behind the stories, let's do some history. After the life of Jesus, his followers left Judea for the wider Roman Empire as they preached about all this amazing stuff that just happened and began converting interested Romans to the spiffy new religion. These messengers, called apostles, relayed their experience with Jesus in the most natural and obvious way, oral storytelling. In visiting communities across the Greco-Roman world and sharing their eyewitness accounts, they earned new converts to Christianity and grew that pool of storytellers. Friends telling friends, neighbor telling neighbor, worker telling worker, family telling family. This was fantastic for growing a religious community, but not so conducive to narrative of cohesion, because Christians in Italy would have been circulating a distinct set of stories from Christians in Anatolia or Egypt. That's hardly a crisis, as variation is a natural part of any oral tradition and stories can have differences without being incompatible, but it was problematic if not everyone agreed on the core theology. Around the 50s AD, one apostle was acutely aware of that issue, as he had gone around founding churches in Greece and Asia Minor and later realized these communities needed some help keeping their theology straight. So he did what high-class Romans love more than life itself, and wrote letters. This apostle, Paul, wrote to all of his communities about philosophy, ethics, and, of course, theology. And these letters are among the earliest surviving Christian writings we have. Together, they comprise 14 books of what later became the Christian Bible, though modern scholarship is sus on half of them, only counting seven as definitely written by Paul himself. Clearly, Paul wasn't the only Christian who appreciated a good postal system, as scripture includes seven other Catholic or universal epistles from other authors, bringing our book tally to 21. Of course, apostolic postage won't sustain a religion on its own, and eventually the oral storytelling about the life of Christ found its way into writing as the Gospels. The word comes from an Old English translation of the Greek evangelion, meaning good news. Their authors, the evangelists, are therefore bringers of good news and didn't see themselves as writing a rigid historical account, but sharing what Jesus' life and death meant ideologically for Christians. The first author to do that, probably, was Mark. Now, even probably is a stretch, because all of the Gospels were written anonymously, with their named authors attributed decades later. The early church tradition ascribes them to four of Jesus' known followers because it felt nicer than leaving the byline blank, and we know about those four from their appearances in these very Gospels, so it's tempting to connect the authors with their named characters. Matthew was a tax collector, John was a cousin of Jesus, Luke was a physician, but still, characterization for people who aren't Jesus is a little thin on the ground anyway. In reality, the writers of each Gospel are as invisible as the oral storytellers who preceded them. We know the rough dates of composition, and we can take guesses at what kind of person 
wrote each of them, but ultimately they too derive from the great undefined mist. Ain't that the way? So with that said, Mark wrote in the late 60s AD and tells the story of Jesus' ministry, his death, and resurrection. Jesus tells parables about the kingdom of heaven and performs miracles to prove that the kingdom is near, but Mark's portrayal of Jesus always keeps his identity on the down low, to the point where the centurion who crucifies him is the first character to say, holy crap, that was the son of God. Mark's gospel hits all the big theological beats, but the emphasis lies in Jesus' deeds and strength in the face of adversity. The next two gospels were written around the 80s AD, traditionally attributed to the apostles Matthew and Luke. Both of their gospels include the nativity when Jesus was born, but each of them handle it in a different way. Matthew recites a genealogy tracing Jesus back up to the Israelite King David and paints him as fulfilling the role of the Jewish savior figure, the Messiah. Luke, however, traces the genealogy back to Adam and Eve, which theologically I'd hope so, but the point is to portray Jesus as a universal figure, not just for the Jews. And this all gets a smidge dicey when Matthew makes a point to show how Jesus is fulfilling ancient prophecies from the Hebrew Bible, yet his narration is vehemently critical of the actual Jewish people in his story, and Luke's theological framing is that Jesus was rejected by the contemporary Jews, so he instead took his message to the rest of the world, called the Gentiles. It's subtle if you're not looking for it, but oh boy, it's there, and it had consequences. But moving on rapidly, both of these Gospels have unique stories and distinct philosophical messages compared to each other and to Mark, but if you go to the text, you'll see they're deeply similar. These three are called the Synoptic Gospels, from the Greek word for seen together, and putting them side by side reveals phrases and entire sections that are word for word between them. Three quarters of Mark appears in Matthew and Luke, and those two further share a quarter of their text, which may have arisen in the oral tradition after Mark's composition, or simply came from elsewhere in the Roman world. It's honestly pretty dang cool to trace these similarities and learn from where they diverge. The author of Luke, not Luke himself, but that's for modern scholars to nitpick, also wrote the Acts of the Apostles, a narrative following the resurrection of Christ that details how the apostles began their mission to build this new Christian faith, transforming what began as a sect of Judaism into a pan-imperial Roman religion. Then, of course, there's the odd man out in our band of Bible beetles, and that would be John. Written sometime in the 90s AD, the Gospel of John appears to have come from an entirely separate oral tradition as it shares sparingly few details with the synoptics outside of the death and resurrection. Arguably the most important feature of John's Gospel is the focus on divinity. It's John who says that in the beginning there was the Word, and that divine Word, which spoke the universe into being, became flesh as Jesus. This portrayal of the Son of God makes it abundantly clear that he is the Son of God, and on top of his proclamations that the Father and I are one, or I am the way, the truth, and the light, his miracles serve as thematic demonstrations of his divinity. I am the resurrection, he says, so he raises Lazarus from the dead. I am the bread of life, so he splits the loaves of bread. I am the light of the world, so he gives sight to the blind. It fits so nicely, that's just good storytelling. What's also remarkable is how much is absent versus the synoptics. No birth story, no baptism, no parables, no transfiguration, no Last Supper, not even the trial. We love illegal drama. What we're seeing here isn't one author going rogue, but the artifact of a unique storytelling tradition that evolved independently of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as we'll see, not the only one. So these gospels tell the same fundamental story, but have their own features, sub-stories, and core ideas. The synoptics can align verbatim when you put them side by side, but all four have elements that may seem to conflict. Mark's Jesus keeps his identity a secret, yet John has him proclaiming it everywhere. Is that a problem? Well... Not really. These aren't histories meant to be cross-examined in a lab, smashed together with a particle accelerator to see which atoms of the plot fly off. They're literature, meant to be experienced individually. Epic poems expressing why Jesus mattered to people. Each tells a complete, cohesive story that makes clear narrative sense on its own, and then we have the entire field of theology to investigate them as a set. All four Gospels followed the Christian orthodoxy of belief, so in the eyes of the Church, no problem. That said, elsewhere in the Mediterranean world, other oral traditions got written down, such as the infancy gospels recounting the childhood of Jesus before he embarked on his ministry. These, notably, did not make it into the Bible, like the infancy gospel of Thomas, where Jesus fully kills people as a five-year-old before deciding to stop being a scamp and revive them, or the gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, where Kitty Jesus flees to Egypt and tames a cave full of dragons. From fragments to full text, we've found two dozen of these non-canon gospels, but there could have been hundreds. Some of them read like mere novelties, while others were treated as genuine scripture by their communities for a very long time, like the gospel of Peter, discovered in the tomb of an 8th century Egyptian monk. Impressive dedication by the monk, because 
because that gospel was branded heretical five centuries earlier for its implication that Jesus was only divine and not human. Debates like these are complex even by theology standards, and the process of establishing a consistent orthodoxy played out over centuries of early church history. And this runs parallel to the task of codifying the New Testament, deciding what gets included and what's left out. Because just writing a gospel does not make it universal scripture. Exhibit A, Jesus Christ the Dragon Prince. <laughs> First, the books had to be widely read and meticulously hand-copied frequently enough to keep them in circulation, and any potential scripture had to be church-certified heresy-free. Once again, Jesus Christ the Dragon Prince. That's a process! The earliest surviving Christian scripture hails from the late 200s, and it wasn't until 367 that Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria compiled what we call the New Testament as a readings list for his churches. Even still, it took a few decades before the rest of Christendom got on board. As a window into a culture in motion, I find the history of the early Christian church delightfully enigmatic, and the Gospels demonstrate that gorgeously. A set of biographies constructed by an invisible chain of everyday storytellers, later codified by anonymous scribes, and considered so sacred that they must have been the works of four apostles. And I don't have to find those stories true to find that history beautiful. Thank you for watching. As a bonus bit of cultural flavor text, if you've ever wanted to imagine how insufferably smug the Byzantine Empire would have been throughout medieval history, consider that they were the ones reading the Christian Bible in its original Greek. Is my historical faith problematic? Of course not, it's the Latin speakers who are wrong. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, every translation is fine. Except for the King James Version. Okay, that's all my spice. See you next time. Bye!